Hi, I'm Mr. Dove, and this is Bio Lessons to Go, Meiosis and the Origins of Genetic Variation. In sexually reproducing organisms, two parents produce offspring and pass on their genes to the next generation. Now, in order for two parents to give equal amounts of genetic information and produce a child with the same amount of chromosomes as themselves, each must give half of their genes. Let's take a look at an example of what would happen if this wasn't the case. If two human parents, each having 46 chromosomes, gave their complete complement, all of their chromosomes, to the next generation, the chromosome number would double. If this continued into the next generation, the chromosome number would double again. This exponential increase in chromosome uh, number would make it very difficult biologically for life to continue. And so it's essential that we have a process which allows for parents to give half of their genes if we're going to reproduce sexually. Now in order to give half of their genes to their offspring, parents produce specialized cells called gametes or sex cells. Males produce sperm in their testes, while females produce the gametes called eggs in their ovaries. Now each gamete has exactly one half of the normal number of chromosomes. Cells that have half of the normal number of chromosomes are said to be haploid. Notice that haploid kind of sounds like half. In humans, that haploid number is 23. So we're going to start off with 46 chromosomes, and as we produce our sperm and egg, they're going to be haploid. They're going to be reduced down to 23 chromosomes in each sex cell. In the process of sexual reproduction, the nuclei of the gametes join together. This fusion of the nuclei is called fertilization. The resulting cell, a fertilized egg, is called a zygote. So our sperm cell will fuse with our egg cell during fertilization. And this fertilized egg is also known as a zygote. Now after fertilization, the zygote and all the body cells that come from the mitotic division of the zygote have two sets of chromosomes. These cells are now referred to as diploid. In humans, that diploid number is going to be 46. So here we've got two adults. They're starting off as a diploid set. They've got a total of 46 chromosomes in their cells. They produce their gametes, their sperm and egg. And that sperm and egg are haploid, and the haploid number is 23, because 23 is half of 46. After fertilization, the sperm and egg produce a zygote, and that zygote now has 46 chromosomes. It's back to being diploid. That zygote, that first fertilized egg, is going to divide by the process of mitosis, and we're going to grow and develop and return to an adult state which is still diploid. So let's take a look at a uh, comparison between our gametes and our zygotes. So our gametes are going to be our sperm and egg, and they are considered to be haploid. So in this sperm cell we have three chromosomes, and this egg cell we have three chromosomes. They're haploid. Um, haploid is oftentimes represented um, as the letter N, like one N. Zygote is going to be our fertilized egg, and that's what arises after fertilization. So here we've got our fertilized zygote. And if we count up our chromosomes, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, we've returned to our diploid state after fertilization. Um, and the diploid is oftentimes referred to as the 2n number. So 2n, 2 times 3 is 6. We return to our diploid state after fertilization. So in order to produce gametes, in order to produce cells that have half the chromosome number, we need to have a specialized type of cell division. This specialized cell division is referred to as meiosis. Now, meiosis 
is a process of cell division, and it's very similar to mitosis, but there are two distinct differences. First of all, mitosis is a single division. In that division, we produce two cells that are identical to the original cell. They are identical to the original cell. So if we start off with a diploid cell, each of the resulting cells are going to also be diploid. The reason is, is because we're using this process for growth and repair. And we want all of the new cells that are derived by mitosis to be identical to the one that we started off with. Because if we get a cut and we're repairing our skin, we want those cells to be identical to the ones that we lost. But remember, in meiosis, meiosis is all about making sex cells. And to make sex cells, we need them to have half the chromosome number. And so meiosis is two divisions. Uh, the first division is called meiosis 1, and the second division is called meiosis 2. Very clever names. In the end of meiosis, we're going to get four cells that are haploid. They have half the chromosome number than what we started off with. And remember, the reason is we're producing sex cells. And after fertilization, those haploid gametes are going to refuse to make that zygote that will have the same chromosome number as the adults. And so meiosis needs to have two divisions to make haploid gametes so that each generation will have the same chromosome number as the previous one. Prior to meiosis or mitosis, DNA replication occurs. In both meiosis and mitosis, the nuclear membrane breaks down as the DNA organizes into chromosomes. In meiosis, chromosome pairs come together, or synapse, and crossing over occurs, resulting in mixing of the genetic information between the chromosome pairs. The paired chromosomes then align along the central plate of the cell and subsequently separate, one traveling to each end of the cell. In meiosis, a second division sequence occurs, resulting in four cells with half the number of chromosomes. Mitosis involves a single division sequence, resulting in two cells with no net change in the number of chromosomes. Now let us examine meiosis in greater detail. Meiosis begins with meiosis 1. Meiosis 1 is oftentimes referred to as reductive division because it's during this process that the chromosome number is going to be halved. Meiosis 1 begins with interphase 1. During interphase 1, this is when the chromosomes are going to duplicate. After the chromosomes have duplicated, we'll enter into prophase 1. As in mitosis, during prophase 1, uh, the nuclear membrane begins to break down. Spindle fibers form as centrioles move towards the poles. One way that meiosis is different from mitosis can be seen here. Um, it is during prophase 1 that the sister chromatids are going to uh, match up with their homo homolog and form what are called tetrads. Tetra means four, and so we'll have four chromosomes, or two pairs of sisters that are lined up. It is during this stage that the homologs um, can pair up and exchange genetic material in a process called crossing over. Um, and this is going to allow for greater genetic diversity as we move forward. Next will be metaphase 1. During metaphase 1, uh, the tetrads are going to line up on the equatorial plane. Um, they're to the sides of the equatorial plane. During anaphase 1, uh, the homologs are going to separate and move towards the poles. What this is going to do is it's going to reduce the chromosome number in half. We started off at the beginning with one, two, three, four chromosomes. And in each resulting um, cell at the end, we're going to have two. So we've reduced that chromosome number in half. So you'd think we could just stop right then. But the problem is, at the end of meiosis one, the chromosomes are still doubled. So in meiosis 2, the chromosome number isn't being reduced further. Rather, the chromatids from each double-stranded chromosome are going to be separated. So in meiosis 2, we're going to start off with 
uh, in humans, 23 double-stranded chromosomes. And in the end, we're going to end up with uh, 23 single-stranded chromosomes in the final um, daughter cells. And those daughter cells will re remain a haploid. So let's take a look at a video that explains this in greater detail. In prophase 1, the DNA coils tightly and individual chromosomes become visible under the light microscope. Homologous chromosomes become closely associated in synapses and they exchange segments by crossing over. By metaphase 1, the nuclear membrane has disappeared and the microtubules form a spindle. Spindle fibers attach to only one side of each centromere and the two homologous chromosomes attach to microtubules orienting from opposite poles. Each pair of homologs then lines up on the metaphase plate. Either maternal or paternal homolog may orient toward a given pole. In anaphase 1, the microtubules of the spindle fiber shorten and pull the chromosomes toward the poles, taking both sister chromatids with them. Each pole ends up with a complete haploid set of chromosomes consisting of one member of the homologous pair. During telophase 1, the nuclear membrane reforms around the daughter nuclei. Each daughter nucleus contains two sister chromatids for each chromosome attached to a common centromere. Because of crossing over, the two sister chromatids are not identical. During prophase two, the nuclear envelope breaks down and a new spindle forms. In metaphase two, spindle fibers bind to both sides of the centromeres. During anaphase two, the spindle fibers contract and the sister chromatids move toward opposite poles. In telophase two, nuclear envelopes reform around the sets of daughter chromosomes. At the end of meiosis, we should end up with four haploid gametes. But in humans, typically only one mature egg is produced each month. So the production of an egg by meiosis has got to be slightly different than that of the production of sperm. During spermatogenesis, the formation of sperm, we end up with four haploid sperm cells at the end. But oogenesis, with each division, there's going to be an uneven distribution of cytoplasm, producing what are known as polar bodies. These polar bodies are unusable and must be discarded by the body. So at the end of meiosis, we'll end up with one mature egg cell and one, two, three unusable polar bodies. Meiosis is a major source of variation uh, for sexually reproducing organisms. With the exception of identical twins, children of the same family are never exactly alike. The explanation for these differences lies in the details of meiosis one. One of the first sources of variation comes in the form of crossing over. Crossing over occurs during prophase one of meiosis. Remember, it's during prophase one of meiosis that the tetrads form, when the sister chromatids are going to line up with their homo homolog. During this process, the chromatids of these homologous chromosomes are very, very close to each other, such that they will sometimes overlap at a point called the chiasma. It is during this overlap that the homologous segments um, can exchange places in the process called crossing over. As a result of crossing over, genetic recombination occurs, such that the offspring that may receive these chromosomes will have combinations that perhaps the parents never had. The second example of where variation occurs during meiosis occurs during metaphase one of meiosis. During metaphase one, the homologous pairs of chromosomes, the tetrads, will line up on the equatorial plane, and how they line up is a matter of chance. Each chromosome will orient itself independently of another pair. Each time meiosis occurs, that lining up can be different. This is known as independent assortment. In humans, there are more than 8 million different possible arrangements, or 2 to the 23rd combinations. Let's take a look at an example of independent assortment. Here we have um, a 
cell which contains a diploid number of six chromosomes. So a haploid number of three. So there are two to the three different possible combinations for the uh, chromosomes to line up during metaphase one. Two to the three results in eight different combinations that we can see illustrated here. Um, in one case, all of the light colored chromosomes could line up on one side of the equ uh, equator while the darker ones on the other side. And so you'll get uh, this combination of chromosomes um, in the resulting gametes. Each combination, each way that they line up, will result in a completely different combination of chromosomes. So you'll get a, a gametes which contain a mix of chromosomes from both of their parents. So meiosis is an important process. It's important because it maintains the species chromosome number from generation to generation by allowing for the preparation of haploid gametes. It's also important because it increases the genetic variation in sexually reproducing organisms by allowing for crossing over and independent assortment to create new combinations of genes in the eggs and sperm so that the offspring have a wide variety of um, genetic characteristics. Soon we'll be examining the probability of inheriting these various combinations of genes um, as we further explore genetics.